Well, this morning we are in a sermon series called Truth in a World of Gray. We started that series last week, and uh, one of the reasons we're, we're in this series is just because of a lot of the, the craziness that's gone on in our culture. And, and, and we've talked about a number of times how, how the church for, for about 1,700, 1,750 years was in a uh, a privileged place at the center of culture, but then uh, uh, in, our, in our own country, the last 50, 60 years, it's been moving more and more into the margin. And there's all kinds of consequences associated with that. And, and one of those things has been a, a worldview that was predominantly shaped by scripture. And, and part of that worldview was a belief in absolute truth and absolute right and wrong. And one of the things that we've seen in our culture as, as Christianity has moved to the margin, so has that worldview. And so has the foundations upon which we, we understand even how we interpret reality and, and, and all the things with that. And so we're, we're dealing with a lot of confusion in the world today, even, even trying to figure out how do we confront things we know are wrong. Uh, like we, we started with that video last week where the, the guy goes and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a white guy and he goes and tells people, you know, what would you say if I told you I was a Chinese woman? And they just don't know how to respond to that. And, and we see that that's just symptomatic of our culture and where it's at. When you, when you lose that basis for talking about absolute truth and absolute right and wrong. And today we're going to dive into a different topic and we're going to talk about grace and truth together and why that's important. And there, there's, a, there's a, a sequence to how we're talking about things uh, and, and it's going to be important, by the way, if, if you miss something, this sermon series, they, they, it, it builds on top of each other. It's kind of like one long sermon in some ways. Uh, but before, before we talk about the stuff we're talking about next week, uh, we talk about truth and consequences, we need to talk about grace and truth together. And, and so this is an important thing we're going to look at today. Now, when we think about grace and truth, uh, the Bible is very clear that that's what Jesus was all about. That he came full of grace and he came full of truth. And, and one of the things that we recognize is that um, both, both are important and both are necessary, but we might have a, a favorite. We might have something we, we lean to in certain circumstances and, and maybe a different direction we lean to in other circumstances. For instance, if you wrong me, I want to deal in truth. <laughs> but if I wrong you, I want to be dealing in grace. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Right? It, it's, it's almost like a double standard that, that's there. That that because because with truth I think of well there there's there's judgment and there's justice and, and all kinds of things like that that accompany truth, and so when somebody hurts us and there's something wrong you know truth let's 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 be let's talk about truth and and if you really wrong me we're going to talk about truth ooh, 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 five syllable truth <laughs> the, the, and and we're going to bring that to bear on life, but but when somebody uh, when we when we're hurting. Um, and, and when we know that it was wrong and we made a mistake and we sinned, what we'd like is forgiveness. What we'd like to receive is grace. Now, these two things, though, are, are in tension with each other. You have grace over here. You have truth over here. And, and the answer is not to blend them and meet in the middle. Let's have something that's kind of true and kind of grace-filled, right? Yeah, yeah you know, that, that's just not a good idea, right? You, you need both of those things in tension. We need them in our world. And, and when we don't have both of them, things get a little wonky. They, they, they don't go like they should, and they create all kinds of other problems in, in the world today. And, and one of the things that, that we love about Jesus is that, that he came full of grace and truth. And, and the truth that, that part of the truth is, is that you and I, we are sinners and we are broken. And, and if we probably understood the full extent of that truth, it would devastate us. We, and, and if we had to face the consequences of that truth, it would destroy us. We, we can't actually face the consequences of that truth. Now, and, now, and most religions in the world today, they, they try to deal with that truth by saying, well, you just got to make up for the bad things. And you just try to make the good balance out the bad and be basically a good person. But the Bible says the truth is you can't do that. The, the, the magnitude of, of the things that are wrong and, and things that are broken are on a scale that, that you just can't fix. And, and, and that's part of the truth. And, and if, if all we had was that truth, there would be no hope, would there? 
we'd go, wow, we, we've sinned against a holy God and now we're all doomed, you know, let's go home. <laughs> that, but that, that's, that's not, that, that is the truth, but it's not the whole truth. You see, there's another part of it. There's also grace because Jesus understood that that truth is something we couldn't bear. He said, I'm going to come in and, and, and I'm going to take justice upon myself. And, and in its place, I give you forgiveness and righteousness. That's why we say at the cross and in the person of Jesus Christ, both grace and truth come together. And both of these things are important. And, and both of them live in tension with us. Now, another important truth, though, is that if you don't have grace and truth together, something is missing. Now, uh, I want to let you know there, there's some trouble that has been brewing in the Isaacson household. Let's, let's see how this pans out here. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Got to get upstairs and do my homework. Great day at school. Bye. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Hang on. Hang on, young lady. Can you come over here? We want to, your mom and I want to talk to you. But Dad, I've got a ton of homework to do. I have a bio test and a math quiz and haven't even started on my world study. Why don't you come and sit down? We okay. really need to talk. Right there. <laughs> Hi. So, I got this letter in the mail today. It says here that you've had, what does it say, eight school days that you've been absent from school? Have you been skipping classes? Uh... Sydney, tell us what's going on. This isn't how we raised you. We want to know the truth. Yes, it's true. <laughs> now, there's a problem here, isn't there? <laughs> and we want to talk about some, some different possible ways that the Isaacsons can deal with this problem. First, let's look at what happens if you just deal with truth without grace. Are you kidding me? Are you an idiot? Only losers skip school. Are you a loser? Answer me, girl. Well, I... Not I, quite. I, Not while I'm talking. <laughs> now, you know what? This is something that happens, and I can't believe that you do something like this. But you know what? It's, it's just it's so frustrating sometimes. And, ah, uh, oh, just... It's Sydney, we are so ashamed of you. <sighs> You're grounded for a year. I, you, you don't even think about going to that party this weekend because, oh, get ready for a ton of dishes and vacuuming and anything else that I can think of because you are not leaving this house. Now, go to your room. But, Mom, I... Go to your room! <laughs> That's one way to handle a problem. <laughs> and, 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 and there you see, that it's true. She messed up, and, and, and there, there's consequences. And in some ways, justice is, is being administered by the parents. Now, the, there's a problem, though. Any time that we speak truth without love and truth without grace, we, we end up with, with a problem. In fact, Tim Keller puts it this way. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we can't really hear it. It's true, she messed up. It's true. So let's push rewind for a second. <laughs> yeah. And let's see what happens if we deal with grace without truth. Honey, that's okay. You know what? I, I'm sure that it just gets tiring day after day after day with you have P.E. and lunch breaks and all those different things you do. I get it. It, it can be tiring. I know. Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, oh. the day does drag on and on. Yeah. Oh, you need a break from school. Yes. You're our special little girl. <laughs> we won't judge you, Cupcake. Everyone needs to decide what's important in their own lives. Right, honey? Absolutely, dear. In fact, you know what? Who are we to judge? If you don't want to school, if you don't want to go to school, why should we say so? In fact, you know what we could do? With all that money we save towards like the school fees and, and you know the books and all those different activities that we do, you know what? I think we could put that towards a better use. 
how about, you know what, I think you deserve a new car. What a great idea. Yeah. Oh, sounds good to me. You guys are the best parents ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's another way to deal with things, too, isn't it? And you've got uh, grace w without truth. And, and, and here's, here's what Tim Keller says about that. He says, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws. And, and, and here, here's this problem, right, that, that Sydney had skipped school, but it was never really addressed. It was just kind of sugar-coated, and, and we're just going just gonna to love. We're just going to show grace. All right, well, let's, let's push rewind one more time. <laughs> And, and let's, let's see what it looks like to combine grace and truth together. You know, Sid, we are disappointed that you skipped school, and it, we're disappointed that the, you deceived us. Sweetheart, we both love you very much. Yeah. And getting a good education is really important. We want you to succeed. And that needs to start here and now, with you making an effort to get to school and do the best you can. But school is boring and all my friends ditch. Yeah, but you know that doesn't make it right. And I know it's tough to stay on top of the priorities of school and different things like that, but you know what? That education is vital to your future. I know. <clears throat> well, we just want what's best for you, okay? Yeah. You know, you are gonna have to earn back our trust though. So we're gonna stay in touch with your teachers for a little while and just make sure you're getting to class. And as a consequence, I think you need to be grounded for about a week. I'm sorry I disappointed you guys, and that sounds like a reasonable consequence. It won't happen again, I promise. <laughs> Just remember, we love you. And we forgive you. I love you too. Oh, let's give him a hand. All right, all right. Good job. Thank you, Isaacsons. Thank you. You see an example of a couple of problems. If, if, if we just have truth or we just have grace, something is missing. But when the two things are applied together, when there's both grace and truth, it actually brings a type of life and healing and a wholeness in our own lives. That's what we're after as followers of Jesus. And we mentioned that Jesus lived this out per perfectly, a combination of, of grace and truth. And, and, and one of the examples in Jesus' life where he does this, it has to do with uh, this woman that was caught in adultery. There were some Pharisees that were, they were, they were really trying to set a trap for Jesus, and, um, and, and they caught a woman in adultery, and, and they only bring the woman for some reason, which doesn't seem quite fair, uh, but they, they, they bring him in front of Jesus, and, and they, they go, all right, we've got him trapped now. Because if he, if he says... Uh, just forgive her, well, then he's ignoring the law. Because the law says that, that a woman that's caught in adultery is supposed to be stoned. And so if he forgives her, we'll get him on the law and say, what, don't you believe in the law of Moses? But, but if, he, if he says stone her, we'll go, ha, he's not a very nice guy after all. And so we've got Jesus trapped, right? And, and every time the Pharisees think that, it never goes well for them, does it? Never, 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 never. And so they, they've got this woman, and, and they, they, they bring her in front of Jesus, and, and there's all these people around, and they said, okay, so Jesus, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so Jesus uh, writes on the ground for a minute. We don't know exactly what he wrote. Pauses. And he says to the group, he says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Whichever one of you is without sin, you throw the first stone. They stoop back down and begin to write some more. And then something remarkable happened. They begin to walk away one after another, beginning with the oldest. And, and that's an important detail because it's, it's the oldest in, in that culture that's supposed to speak up and come back with something at Jesus, and they can't. <laughs> And they begin to all walk away until no one is left. And then Jesus looks at the woman. He says, woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. 
He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and leave this life of sin. And, and what Jesus did there was just a, a, a beautiful example of what it looks like to bring grace and truth to bear in a situation. You see, the truth was, the Bible did say she could be stoned for what happened. That, could have, that, that, that was truth, that was justice, that was considered justice then. And yet Jesus brought some other truth to bear. He said, okay, as soon as you realize, uh, you know, that, that, that as soon as you can say that I haven't sinned, you can throw the first stone. And, and they recognize that, that while maybe they didn't have that particular sin, that they, they couldn't meet that requirement. And, and the funny thing was, is that the only one left there that could have actually thrown the stone said, I want to offer you grace. I don't condemn you. He offers grace. But then he also says, you need to stop. There needs to be a change. And I love the fact that Jesus didn't just say, hey, no big deal. <laughs> he didn't say, you know, God's got bigger fish to fry, don't worry about that. That's not what he said. He spoke grace, but he also said, this is wrong. This is in alignment with who God's made you to be. This isn't it. You need to leave that. It's not good for you. It doesn't honor God. It doesn't honor the people around you. Leave that sin. And he did it with both. And, and Jesus lived this way over and over again. And, and it drove the people around him crazy. But it was the way that he loved. When I think about this for you and for me and, and, and how, how we begin to incorporate modeling Jesus, living like Jesus in our own lives, we need to be people of grace and truth. And I want to talk about this on two levels. There's one is our, our collective uh, life together as a church and then one also on an individual level. As a church, if, if we live with one of those without the other, it creates all kinds of problems. And, 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 and we see both of them today, and maybe you've been part of a church before that, that kind of had one without the other. If, if, you, if you're part of a, a church without grace, if a church, pardon me, if a church has grace without truth, one of the problems we get is that, that anything goes. And, and, and we begin to actually change the truth of God's word. And when God speaks to something, if God speaks to something, we say, well, you know, that was a long time ago. And, and you know, that, that was in a, in a half a world away and thousands of years ago. And, you know, we're a little more enlightened now. We don't think that way anymore. And so uh, when it comes to, to sexuality and, and, and all kinds of other things that, that maybe our culture doesn't agree with, um, we're going to go with our culture over what the Bible says because we think that's the right way to go. And, and, and that's what happens in a church that has grace but not truth. And, and that creates all kinds of problems because you're ignoring the eternal word of God when we do that. And, 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 it, and it creates all kinds of issues. And then on the other side is, is truth without grace. And, and, and there are all kinds of churches out there, and this is often what's portrayed by the media, that, that will speak truth and will say, God's disappointed in this. Or that, that would be a nice way of saying what they say. God hates this. And, and, and they oftentimes don't just say the sin. They also seem to include the people who are doing it. God hates homosexuality. God's against abortion. God's against these things. And, and, and see, you know what? God really is against those things. He's very clear about it in his word. He is against those things. But the problem is there, there's some more truth that doesn't often get mentioned. He's also against heterosexual sin. He's also against liars. He's also against thieves. I mean, we can, there's a whole bunch of things that God's actually against. He's against those things. And, and the problem is, is that, that in, in the, the larger culture today, the church is known more about what it's, more by what it's against than what it's for. Because those voices have come through loud and clear. And, and the problem is they're, they're true for the most part it's just not the whole truth. 
it, it's true that God doesn't like those things. It's true that God didn't make the world to operate in that way. Absolutely right. But here, here's, the, here's the problem. This is Robbie Zacharias. He's a, he's a famous Christian um, apologist, defender of the faith. He says, truth that is not undergirded by love makes the truth obnoxious and the possessor of it repulsive. And friends, there's a lot of people in our world today that view the Christian church that way. Because they, they've seen truth without grace. And for, for us as, as a church, what, what we want to be is people that don't shy away from the truth. That we call a sin a sin. We call it what it is. But we also understand that, that even though God's against a bunch of things, he also loves all the people. And he wants to draw all people to himself. And, 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 and even though uh, we really have to look at ourselves too, don't we? Because the minute we begin to, to look out there at the world around us and, and, and take the focus off of ourselves, it becomes very easy to want to deal just with truth, doesn't it? That's what the Pharisees did. We want to deal just with truth. We want to point out all the things that are wrong with you. But that's not helpful for us. In fact, it can actually be damaging spiritually and creates a, a kind of pride and, and, and even a, a spiritual one-upmanship on people. The truth is, is that we're broken. We're all sinful and we're all broken but it looks different in different people's lives. We're all in need of grace. And, and there seems to be this tension that we have to live in to figure out how do, how do we speak the truth that doesn't change and even to a world that doesn't want to hear it, but at the same time do it in a way that they know that they're loved, that they're loved. And we understand that we're not better than anybody else. And friends, that's one of the hardest things in the world to communicate. And, and I don't think we're ever going to be able to do it on a massive scale. It, it, it won't happen. I think the only way that that's going to happen is for you and for me in our individual lives and our relationships to model this for people. For you and for me to be known as people who are, are, are for both grace and truth. That's how we counteract a lot of what goes on in the media. That we are people that stand for both grace and truth. That we're not the ones that are there to throw the stones. So let's talk about what this could look like on an individual level. One of the things that, that's come up more and more uh, today, I, I, probably in the last two or three years, just, uh, just dozens of people have actually you know, I've talked to him about this issue, is we, we've got a, a friend or a close family member that's, that's homosexual and they're, and they're having a wedding and they're inviting us. So what do we do? And, and, and this, this is where the, that tension really comes together of grace and truth. And, and, and see, the, these, are, these are strong Christians and they're going, how do we respond to this? Because truth without grace would sound something like, well, we don't approve. We want nothing to do with you. Um, in fact, we're, you know, we're, not, we're not even sure we want to continue a relationship with you because God doesn't like this. That's truth without grace. Grace without truth would be, hey, we love you. It's no big deal. We'll, we'll come and we'll celebrate this along with you. And, and friends, those are the two easiest things to do in the world, to go to one extreme or the other. You tell truth and you lose a relationship. You go with grace and you set aside your convictions and the very things that, that maybe you've built your life upon. So what's it actually look like in that situation? And by the way, I don't know that there's one right answer to this. I'm just giving one example on how it might be handled. You might meet with someone or call them or write a letter, whatever it is, and say, first of all, we want you to know that we love you. And, and we're gonna love you no matter what. Because you're always gonna be our nephew or our, our son or whatever it is. That, that, and that will never change. It's always the case. 
And yet we're put in a very awkward situation because you're asking us to come and celebrate something that God has said is, is wrong. And, and it puts us in such an odd place because we love our Lord and we love you together. And, and, and when you ask us to, to, to address this, this kind of a, when you ask us to come and to, to, to not just be there but to celebrate it with you, it, it makes us have to, to set aside our convictions in order to be there. And yet at the same time, we want you to know that we love you and, and we want to do that always. We want to communicate that. That we love you, but we don't support this decision. And we can't celebrate something that God calls wrong. And, and then at that point, a person may go. They may say, we're, we're going to go and we're going to be part of this because we love you, but please understand that we can't celebrate what you're doing. Or they may choose not to go. And they might say, you know, uh, we love you, but we just can't be there as part of that. I think both of those can be appropriate ways to express grace and truth. But we don't want to. We don't want to just do one or the other, because something is missing when that happens. Friends, this is going to be something that's easy to talk about here. It's pretty easy to think about when it's theoretical. But I know it's something that you've already run into and we're gonna run into as, as followers of Jesus more and more in the future. That we're gonna be presented with things where, where, there's a, where we're, we're asked to celebrate, we're asked to participate in things that God calls wrong. And at the same time, there's a way that we can respond that is with love. And, and managing that, that tension of grace and truth, I think, is going to be one of the biggest challenges for us uh, as, as followers of Jesus in the 21st century, especially in a Western world where, where the Christianity is losing its influence. I think here's another part of the solution. We're called to love like Jesus, and that love calls for both the grace and truth. I love what, what, what Jesus said here. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what's, what's the number one trait supposed to be of, of a follower of Jesus? Love, right? Love, we, we understand that. But, but it's not love as we define it. It's not love as our culture defines it. Jesus actually says, this is love as I've modeled for you. This is love as, as I've shown it to be. And so we, we have to understand when we talk about love, we're, we're, we're going back to Jesus' definition. Not the culture around us, not our personal preferences, but how does Jesus define love? Well, there's a lot of examples, but over and over again, one of the overarching themes is grace and truth those two things together. That's what love looks like. Both of those things together. When one is absent, that's not Jesus. That's not who he is. It's not who he's called us to be. It's not what he's called us to follow and to imitate. But as we seek to love him with our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, as we seek to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are people of both grace and truth. And I think two things are gonna happen. The more we commit to being people of grace and truth, one, there's gonna be some good changes in our own life. There's some times where, where maybe we've spoken the truth, but it hasn't had love surrounded it. And we've damaged some relationships and, and, and maybe we've, we've gone to a place that we never should have. And, and there might be some work we have to do to repair things there. Or, or maybe because we're afraid of making someone upset with us, we, we denied the truth. And we went along and just said, it's all good. And we just spoke words of grace. And, and, and that leads to its own set of problems. But we wanna be people that put those two things together so that we can love, but also stand on a foundation of truth. And when we do that, not only does it bless us, in our relationship with God, 
But as we become more like Jesus, as we imitate him in this way in our life, we become a life-giving people. And even when the world around us doesn't want to hear truth, when we do it in a way that's not judgmental, and we do it in a way that, that people genuinely know they're loved even though we disagree, I think we begin to change some people's hearts. And God uses us to help change some people's minds. That's our challenge. I think it's one of the greatest challenges of, of you and me as followers of Jesus today to be known as people who speak both grace and truth. My hope and my prayer for you is as you, as you take this to heart, you think about some of those things in your own life where you've missed it, where you've erred on one side or the other, and, and you seek to correct it to whatever extent possible, to figure out, all right, Next time this happens, or next time this, you know, we have this discussion, what's it going to like to bring a little more, look like to bring a little more grace into that discussion? Or what's it going to look like to bring a little more truth into that discussion? So that you and I can be people of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you gave us the perfect example of grace and truth together in your son, Jesus Christ. And yet we know, Lord, that this is just going to be incredibly challenging in our life. Lord, we, we don't kid ourselves. We know that this isn't easy. And yet, Father, this is, is also one of those things that's so life-giving for ourselves and for the relationships around us. It's what our world truly needs, is grace and truth together. So Lord, as we do that, protect us from the, any attitudes of superiority with other people. But Lord, we also pray for courage to speak truth. So Lord, let us honor you, let us follow you as people who are known by grace and truth. In the name of Jesus, amen.